Welcome, welcome everybody. I've opened up all the borders, so hurry into the country in an orderly fashion before the authorities realise what I've done. I am the Air Quotes Comedian, and this is the Polemics Podcast. Welcome. Imagine if you collected all the villains from your favourite superhero show, put them together and had them do a podcast or a radio show. That's the advert I saw for that very thing recently. There was like eight of the worst scum humanity had to offer. Alex Jones, who is to news what Fox News is to news. Penis Prager of Prager University, which is to learning what sticking your brain in a blender is to learning. Stephen Crowder, the right-wing comedian who, impossibly, is less funny than I am, and who is to comedy what terminal cancer is to a long, healthy and productive life. And, of course, little Miss Ben Shatiro. Eh, Patrick, I hear you say, deliberately misrepresenting Ben Shapiro's preferred pronouns is transphobic. Am I to understand that you're a bigoted transphobe now? Ah, dear viewer, you got me. You got me dead to rights. But, oh no, in fact you haven't. How foolish you are going to look over the next few seconds as I demonstrate how wrong, how oh so wrong you are. See, I'm not misrepresenting Ben Shatiro's preferred pronouns because he is a little miss. He's a little misogynistic, which isn't to be confused by the fact that he's also a little misogynistic. He certainly likes to spread a little misinformation, like a little misgendering now and then, to further the fact that he's a little misanthropic. Also, he's a little girl. Uh Aha! I hear you say, keep your wig on. The only person offended by me calling Ben Shatiro a little girl would be Ben Shatiro. I mean, if somebody called me a little girl, I'd be flattered and I'd stock up on tampons to prepare for my bloody future. Anyway, I only mention this collection of vomit chunks because they're the kind of people who definitely hate immigrants. Unless, of course, they're milky white. I definitely didn't just mention them to awkwardly shoehorn in the little miss bit. Regular folk are all about strict border control, aren't they? They are willfully incurious as to the actual apparatus and inhumanity that exists as a result of it, whether it's brown children put into cages the size of an engagement ring box, fed scraps of rat meat with a side order of cockroach legs while being denied medical care. Of course, the mothers get medical treatment, don't they? Being sterilised without consent is a medical procedure. Beyond the concentration camps, you have a border patrol who routinely find stashes of water jugs which they proceed to slash. Water jugs left out for people crossing the harsh desert terrain. Water jugs left there by humanitarian NGOs so that families crossing the harsh desert terrain might not die of thirst during their long and arduous journey. I'm not saying border patroller cunts who deserve to be buried up to their necks in the desert flats and have honey poured over their heads so that they can be eaten alive by insects and animals. No, that would be morally wrong. You can't use honey because, as a vegan, I find that reprehensible. No, you'd have to use syrup. That's what should be done to the malignant arseholes who work for border security. Not just because they are directly responsible for the preventable deaths of families crossing the border in the desert, but also because they routinely raid the premises of the charitable organisations who provide shelter, food, drink and medical care for people who just crossed the fucking desert. Imagine being an aid worker and doing humanitarian things like giving water to a dehydrated child or giving food to a starving mother or punching Ben Shatiro repeatedly in the bollocks and then facing decades in prison for doing so. Well, you don't have to imagine it because that has happened many times here in the good old US of A and that, dear viewer, is just the shit the Border Patrol do with legitimate legal authority. 
Get off my land, is the common refrain of English farmers when speaking to some member of the Ramblers Association walking across the farmer's field, asserting their legal right to do so as they do so. An English farmer, perhaps carrying a shotgun or an AK-47 with its ability to go fully automatic still intact, but there the farmer is with his or her shotgun and there's the Rambler whose only arms are left and right even if the Rambler made a mistake and didn't have the right of way, you certainly wouldn't expect to see the farmer raise his or her shotgun, put it to one side and break out into a Bollywood-style musical number. No. In order to witness the spectre of unarmed people being shot merely for crossing an imaginary line, you have to come to the USA and come along with the militias who patrol the US-Mexico border and who come in their pants when they shoot brown people in the face. It's not just the US who takes draconian measures against immigrants. Australia, Scandinavia, Japan and Great Britain Great Britain who recently proposed a policy of rendition for asylum seekers. Rendition is where you ship off undesirables to a black site location where laws and human rights cease to exist. Which is funny because that's exactly where I'd like to see the Tories and the front bench of the Labour Party sent to. I'm not saying I would treat them badly or anything, but Canada might find it had a sudden shortage of maple syrup. Taking the absolute piss, though, in terms of draconian policies regarding asylum seekers are the European countries around the Mediterranean, Italy especially, who have made it illegal for charitable organisations to rescue asylum seekers from the Mediterranean Sea when the boats transporting them have sunk. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. You'd be breaking the law if you pull out drowning asylum seekers from the sea. You could go to prison for saving human lives. The EU went so far as to condemn rescue boats picking up drowning refugees in the Mediterranean. Lifeboats, some of which are operated by Médecins Sans Frontières, those wanton criminals. The chief architect of letting refugees drown needlessly is Matteo Salvini, who, if I saw him drowning in the Mediterranean, I, being a decent human being, would rescue him. Welcome aboard, Mr Salvini. I just need to pop down into the cargo hold to get the syrup. The EU takes the position that a disinterested Libyan Coast Guard should do all the rescuing and that anybody rescued should be taken to Libya. Libya, you'll recall, was liberated by the USA recently. Thanks to being liberated by the USA, its economy collapsed and now there are open slavery markets in operation there. But hey, at least Gaddafi's dead. Hmm, I wonder why people wouldn't want to go to Libya. Ha ha ha, I hear you, dear viewers say. Air quotes comedian has completely misunderstood the meaning of lifeboat ethics and he didn't even do it deliberately for comedic effect. What a fucking idiot. No, dear viewer, I simply haven't got to that bit yet. The broader question, I suppose, is why do people from the global south want to escape tyrannical governments installed by the CIA? Why, oh why, do they want to escape poverty caused by the siphoning off of their country's resources to western countries through multinational corporations backed up by the guns of the US military? What possible reason could there be that they want to leave their own country that has been bombed back into the Stone Age by US missiles and drones because their country made the mistake of not bowing down and licking the boots of the US hegemony. It's a completely baffling mystery that has no hope of ever being solved as to why they want to leave their own country because of food insecurity caused by catastrophic man-made climate change which was caused by multinational fossil fuel corporations amongst others and not by Mrs Jones of Stonebridge Avenue who left her immersion heater on for 10 minutes longer than was necessary on the 10th of May in 1973. 
I am utterly confused as to why these people want to leave their own countries to come here. I can only conclude that it's because they want to watch SpongeBob SquarePants on free-to-air television. Now that I've set the stage, let's get to the crux of this episode. Lifeboat Ethics, the case against helping the poor, was written by Garrett Hardin. To paraphrase the premise of this article then, the USA is a lifeboat on the high seas and there's not enough room for all the brown people coming from the global south. So we have to shoot them before they clamber aboard, because if they're allowed to come aboard, then the lifeboat will sink and everybody will drown. Oh Garrett, deary, deary me. I mean, I knew your article was complete and utter bullshit as soon as I read the subtitle. The case against helping the poor? Let's take Mr. Harton's lifeboat metaphor and briefly examine why it's wrong. So extremely and completely wrong. And evil. Okay, forget about the USA being the lifeboat. Let's just say the lifeboat consists of all the Western countries. The West is not a specific geographical locale in this metaphor, but instead refers to the wealthy, industrialised nations whose population consists of a white majority. I had to change it so that I wouldn't get emails from angry Australians wondering why they had been left out of the metaphor, but by the time I'm done, it's conceivable that angry Australians will send emails anyway asking why I included Australia in the metaphor. So the West is the lifeboat, right? And the nations of the Global South are drowning in the water. What Mr. Garrett Hardin failed to mention was the lifeboat crew had torpedoed the boats of the Global South in order to scoop up the cargo, be that through clandestine and undemocratic regime change like what the CIA does every Thursday morning, or through shady economic practices that keep the Global South in perpetual debt in order to funnel the wealth from the poor nations to the rich ones which is all tied up in the empire building and imperial Realism that is celebrated, if you can believe it, in the history books. Of course, the West isn't a fucking lifeboat, is it? It's a cruise liner with a handful of mega-rich people enjoying the luxury of the upper decks while the majority of the passengers are holed up in steerage, at least for the time that they're not serving canapes, aperitifs, or polishing the deck shoes of their supposed betters. A luxury cruise liner towing cargo ships with enough food, water, and SpongeBob SquarePants Blu-rays for everybody. Why is Lifeboat Ethics, an obscure article written in 1974, relevant to today? What does catastrophic man-made climate change have to do with what I'm talking about? The West has taken the notion of lifeboat ethics to heart, something that can be plainly seen in the policies designed to keep coloured immigrants out of our supposedly civilised society. That much is obvious to everybody who has eyeballs, ears and a mind capable of perceiving reality. Now, you might think Western governments aren't really doing much about catastrophic man-made climate change, right? But actually, they are. It's just a matter of them not doing what they should be. The trouble with Western governments is that they are beholden to multinational corporations. Corporations who constantly lobby for deregulation so that instead of ensuring that toxic sludge they produce is cleaned and made safe before putting it straight into our drinking water, which costs a lot of money and thus hurts their bottom line, they throw a smaller amount of money to lobby the government for deregulation and hey presto, they put their toxic sludge straight into the mouths of newborn babies. Yum yum, drink your toxic sludge little Bethany and your cancer will grow up to be big and strong. There is a saying that people can imagine the end of the world but they can't imagine the end of capitalism. The ultra wealthy oligarchs, the corporations and their government servants don't need to be prognosticators to see that changes caused by catastrophic man-made climate change are coming. Water shortages, food shortages, ever-increasing weather disasters, power outages, yep, 
you oi polloi could get a bit upset if they can't watch Spongebob Squarepants and might feel moved to do something about it. But don't worry, your government, under the careful guidance of oligarchs and multinational corporations, have anticipated that the great unwashed might rise up and they have taken precautions. Climate security is a policy that the US government is pouring billions of dollars into right now. It's happening now. Matt Patrick, I hear you say, spending vast amounts of money to do something about catastrophic man-made climate change is surely a good thing. What's with the ominous music? Oh dear viewer, climate security isn't about tackling catastrophic man-made climate change, no. The government already knows their corporate masters are doing fuck all to mitigate the oncoming storm. But the corporations and the wealthy are concerned about keeping their power and wealth, which could possibly be taken away if the population at large gets pissed off enough. The climate security policy is lifeboat ethics made flesh. The money for climate security is being allocated to the military and law enforcement. You might be having a hard time wondering what some poorly educated, donut-eating wankstain with anger management issues is going to contribute to averting catastrophic man-made climate change. You don't have to though. We've already seen the beta testing of what climate security entails. We saw it with the Standing Rock pipeline protests. We saw the partnership between a fossil fuel corporation working hand in glove with government and law enforcement. Law enforcement who spray protesters with water cannon in sub-zero temperatures. Protesters who, ironically, just wanted a clean drink of water, thank you very much. Yes, I want the water without oil in it, please. We see it in the ever-increasing hysteria generated by the government and media about border policies. Oh, we can't have brown people coming into our country because they will steal all the jobs while simultaneously, somehow, be unemployed and sponging off of the state. Schrodinger's immigrant, everybody. You might have a hard time picturing in your mind's eye how the military are going to tackle catastrophic man-made climate change. Perhaps they'll just shoot at it. Just joking. They will be patrolling the borders of Fortress Europe. Fortress Europe refers to regressive European Union immigration policies instigated by populist right-wing governments that came about as a result of the 2015 refugee crisis. Yeah, don't be shocked to see the Berlin Wall go up again, but this time encompassing the whole of Europe. It seems like there's nothing fucking moral about lifeboat ethics at all, but that's what the West is doing. Look, I know that nation states shouldn't exist, and so it follows that borders shouldn't exist. But nation states do exist, and historically, borders have been a bit more, hmm, relaxed. You know, in the Middle Ages, Eric Larson, the breaker of skulls from Nonnebacken, real place, didn't have the hassle of going through border control, did he? No. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Scarborough. Is this trip business or pleasure? Well, it's a bit of both, really. You know, sometimes the raping, pillaging and burning down the villages can seem like business, but I do enjoy it, you know. I'm sorry, sir. I don't speak Old Norse. You'll have to communicate in Anglo-Saxon. What do you mean, Old Norse? Do you have anything to declare, sir? Nah, not really. Just my old battle axe. I hope you're referring to a weapon and not your significant other, sir. That Bernard Manning style of joke isn't acceptable in these modern times. I was referring to my weapon. It's a big one. Innuendo is fine. Okay, everything seems to be in order. Be sure to visit the Duty Free on your way out. I understand that they have some great deals on mead. Bloody typical that you stereotype me as some mead-drinking barbarian. As it happens, I don't like mead. It tastes like sick. Overly sweet, honey-infused sick. I drink prune juice, the drink of a warrior. That's the end of this episode of The Polemics. 
If you thought it was long, then you should have seen the unedited, unrevised version. That shit had the running time of the opening credits of Deep Space Nine. Be sure to hit the dislike button and twat off.